Today, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, like JB said, standards for project management and organization. And in particular, I want to talk uh, kind of about this idea of shareable science. Um, because what I'm going to argue is that standards are really a driving force in a lot of what we think of today as open and reproducible research and what we want many of you to leave Brain Hack School knowing how to do. Um, so because it's early uh, and because I think this video expresses the state of science today so much better than most, we're going to try and watch this video. I want to make sure the audio comes through, so please let me know if you can't hear it. Let's see. So far, the audio doesn't go through for me, uh, Elizabeth. For the sake of time, we probably want to uh, move ahead. Uh, <laughs> yes, okay. So the, the, link, the link is also, in, uh, I think, in one of the slides of my presentation. This is just a useful, very, very useful thing to watch. You absolutely you have to watch it. But, you, uh, you do have to watch it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the link. But that's, that's maybe not uh, the point. I just, the point to get across with this video that I'm very sad you can't see um, is basically there are two researchers and one wants to reuse another researcher's work. They say, I've seen your paper. I think I could use your data to ask a different question. Can I access your data? And the dialogue is a series of mishaps of not knowing where the data is, not knowing how the data is labeled, not being able to access the format of the data. Um, and if you've been in research for a little while, you'll notice that this is, although it seems ridiculous because there's a talking panda involved, it's not that uncommon to what many people in research have experienced when they go to ask for other people's data or when they just try and reuse older data. Um, so unfortunately, this pretty accurately reflects the state of science today. And I think a nice way to think about that too is just to reflect on the fact that what we're really sharing when we share our science is just a PDF, right? Um, we've really kind of honed in as a field on how do we create really beautiful documents that convey the science we used, but at the end of the day, they're just a PDF. And I really like this uh, analogy that Ola and Carter explore a little bit when they talk about this idea of research debt, which is that because we're just creating PDFs and we're not actually sharing the rest of our scientific process, like all our other research objects involved, it becomes this mountain that we have to climb um, to get to the top and to really be able to see uh, what's next. And what's next more often than not is that you just place another PDF on top of the file. And so as researchers, we can't take advantage of all this knowledge. It's just something we have to surmount and then move on to the next thing. And this has been a problem that's been recognized for a little while, actually. So this is a really lovely quote by Buckheit and Donahoe, where they say that an article about computational science in a scientific publication, so that is the PDF that we all you know, list on our CVs, is not the scholarship itself. It's merely advertising of the scholarship. The actual scholarship is the complete software development environment and the complete set of instructions which generated the figures. So what that means is when we're sharing our research, we don't just want to think about the, the PDF as kind of the end goal, the end product. We really need to think about all of these different pieces that go into it um, because that's where the actual scholarship is and that's what enables us to learn from one another and to move our field forward. Okay, so for this morning, um, like JB said, I'm not going to be the only one talking. I'm going to kind of give the conceptual background here. And what I want to do on the conceptual background is I want to focus on three key points. The first is project management. I'm going to try and convince you that project managers is important, no matter who you are or what you're doing. Um, the second is the role for standards in science. And I'm going to say for sharing science, but I'm going to try and convince you it's, it's very generally important, no matter what your intentions are to share or not. 
And then finally, the, uh, the importance of community-driven development in all of this. Okay, so I'm gonna say that all of the three of these come together into something that I call community-based project management standards. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll also be convinced that uh, this is really what we need and this is what we should be using in our research to move a lot of things forward. But community-based project management standards sounds really fuzzy uh, and not particularly helpful as just a, a banner concept. So what does this really mean? I just wanna break it down into each of the three parts. So the first is this idea of project management. So I told you I would want to convince you that it's important um, and that everyone should use it. But it's easier always to focus on one specific case and then think about how it extrapolates back out to us. So the specific case, um, let's say, is Professor Smith. So Professor Smith is a young PI, let's say, and she's very busy. Um, I'm sure many of you know very busy young PIs. And she is running a lab. She's got a number of graduate students and postdocs. And she has a new student who's just joined the team. And she would really like to make it so that they can reuse some data from a previous graduate student who's, who's now graduated. So let's say this new student, Ellen, um, she wants to get Ellen up and running. And it's Mike's old project. So she just pulls up Mike's project folder. And she says, OK, Ellen, you know, here you go. Here's Mike's old data and code. And I want you to get started. And you know, let's take the project to the next level. So they run into a couple problems. And they're not quite sure you know, what exactly something small means. And so Professor Smith is like, let's contact Mike. Uh, but Mike, since leaving and graduating, is now a data scientist, which I like to say is a business analyst that lives in California. Um, so he's very busy, and he's not necessarily going to respond to Professor Smith's emails. Um, in fact, let's say and he does not respond for several months, and Ellen, meanwhile, is trying to figure out what's going on in these project folders. And the more she digs into them, the more confused she is. She's not sure what some of the variables are, She's not sure uh, what the convention he used for organizing things and how his results are stored. It's all a bit fuzzy. Um, and so what is, what is Professor Smith going to do, right? She's in this situation where she's got a new graduate student. She really wants them to be able to take advantage of this data that she and Mike spent so long collecting and organizing, and she just can't do it. It just, there's no way to easily understand what was done previously and to use it within the lab to help the next person. Um, and I don't know if any of you have experienced this before, but it's a very real thing where you try and take over someone's project and it's just unclear what's supposed to be happening. So maybe you say, okay, that sounds terrible for Professor Smith and for Ellen and maybe for Mike, but he lives in California, so he's fine. Um, but it doesn't sound so terrible for me. Like that doesn't make, that doesn't impact what my life looks like. You know, I, uh, I am in a lab with a brand new PI who's never had graduate students before. Or maybe you say that, you know, I really mostly work alone. Like I don't work with other people. I don't need to worry about being able to understand other people's project organization. But you do. Uh, because much as with Git and GitHub and version control, your number one collaborator is yourself six months ago and she doesn't answer emails. So if you save something in a way that's unclear, um, it quickly becomes a problem where you can't understand uh, what exactly is happening and it, it kind of compounds over time. So you may end up in a situation, I know I have ended up in a situation where I did something over a year ago and I try and go back and understand what I did and it just takes much, much longer than you'd expect to really kind of sit down and put yourself back in that mind space of what exactly was I thinking when I organized the project folders in this way. Um, so having a set project management system will save not only your colleagues, but also yourself, a lot of time and a lot of headache in the long run. Okay, so maybe I've convinced you that project management sounds cool. What is project management? Um, for the purposes of our discussion, I'm going to say that it's a consistent organization for all components of your research project across the life cycle. And 
I've told you now that, you know, when we think about our research project, a lot of times we really focus on the PDF, but if we step back, the components that go into making our science are much broader. So it can include things like data, um, which I'm going to focus on a little bit more in this talk, and you'll hear more about data organization from uh, Chris just a little bit later this morning. It can also focus on code and documentation for those objects. So this could be things like manuscripts or documentation that you write to be used um, by yourself and in the lab. And if we think about kind of looking at open projects, we can see a little bit how this problem manifests. So there was a project in the field of psychology um, called the Reproducibility Project. I'm not sure if folks are aware of it, uh, but basically, the way the reproducibility project went was that there were a series of really high impact psychological studies that had been published uh, in the psychology literature over the years. And the reproducibility project went through and tried to have other groups uh, replicate those studies. So to go ahead and collect new data using the same protocol and see if they got the same results. Um, and here you can see, so there's this platform called OSF, uh, which is where these projects are hosted. And the lovely thing about this is you can really see exactly how their projects are organized. So you can see on OSF storage, they have what looks like documentation. So they have a PDF and they have a Microsoft Word document. They also have some data, some study materials. So what was used to conduct the, study, the stimuli and such. Um, an analysis audit where someone came in and kind of looked at all of the the different pieces, as well as an independent direct replication. So this is where someone uh, just, they, they ran exactly what had been run in the first study. But just by looking at these folders, you can get a sense of how they organize their project. So this is great. You're like, okay, so I see all these different parts of the research cycle kind of laid out. I can see how they all interact. This seems reasonable. But remember, this was the reproducibility project. This was replicating a number of studies and within that, uh, what you realize is that there still wasn't fully standardized project organization. So here's another replication. And now you can see they have uh, this study materials as well. They also have something called cleaning and analysis scripts, something called replication report. Um, so it's now unclear if I want to look across these two, what pieces do I pull? what's the same and what's different across these two different projects because they've approached project management in a slightly different way. Um, so yes, this is, this is sort of a problem. And this is where something like standards can start to come in. So I wanna introduce you to this thing called TIER. Um, although everyone calls it TIER, it really stands for Teaching Integrity and in Empirical Research. And it's one system that you can use to kind of standardize your project management. And what TIER proposes is to recognize the different levels that exist in uh, every data analysis project. So you have your raw data, which is the exact original files you obtained. So for example, for MRI data, this could be your DICOM files. Um, for like Qualtrics data, this would be the files that you downloaded directly from Qualtrics. This is exactly uh, how the information came from the recording device, and it serves as a record of the data that you began the project with. Um, because as we all know, there's a lot of transformation and cleaning that needs to go on. Then you have your analysis code and your analysis data, and this is one or more files which contain all the code and the transformed data that you used in your analysis. So if we're continuing with Qualtrics, maybe this is where you uh, successfully replace the, uh, the period values with actual NANs, as Ross talked about yesterday, or for MRI, after you convert it to Nifty and uh, do some pre-processing on it. That sort of data, as well as the code that you use to generate your exact analysis, those all should be organized in an analysis code and data folder so that someone could come to that folder and replicate exactly what you've done. And then finally, documents. Um, this is the documentation to understand your study, to understand what you were trying to do and what you successfully did. So this would include things like a copy of your final paper, your data appendix, 
where you lay out what all your different terms mean if you have uh, multiple terms and for example like a, a data table as well as a readme file that orients um, anyone to the organization of the folders and where they can expect to find certain pieces of data. And so what it can look like is something like this. Um, what you have is the original data, the analysis data, the command files, and the documents. Ah, can you see my pointer, actually? Yeah, we can. Perfect. Okay, yep. So you have the original files, analysis data, documents, command files. And here you can see as well, you have metadata, um, which tells you about the data files. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I'm just gonna say it's intentionally fuzzy here, but you can already see having a structure like this, if it's standardized, can really help uh, to orient folks to what exactly is happening in a project. Even if you haven't seen that project before in the case of uh, Ellen and Professor Smith, or if you haven't seen that project in a year um, or two years, if you have a better memory than I do. Okay, and something I wanna narrow in on here is, so I said metadata was fuzzy. The other thing I wanna say is fuzzy is this concept of data as, as a whole. Uh, Chris M is gonna talk about this a lot. But for folks like us who work in neuroscience, there are a lot of different things that you could be thinking about here. So in particular, if you work with neuroimaging, you could be thinking about MRIs, you could be thinking about EEG, you could be thinking about um, behavioral measures. And all of this somehow is supposed to go into your analysis data, um, which is to say the least a bit unclear because there's a lot of different ways you could keep and categorize these different data formats. And so we'll get, we'll get uh, in a little bit to more domain specific things, but I just wanna show that this is a very general purpose organization that can be taken to almost any kind of project. And what else is really lucky or lovely about this is that if you uh, want to use it, there's a lot of resources that have gone into making this really readily accessible. So for example, OSF, um, which I mentioned a little bit earlier and is short for the Open Science Framework, actually has this template that you can just go clone. And so you have a copy of it on your OSF repository and you can fill it in with the different bits and pieces of your own project, um, which makes it really, really easy to get started with something like this. Okay, so hopefully you have a little bit of a better idea of what I mean when I say project management. And maybe I've convinced you that project management is for everyone, no matter your career stage and no matter the particular project you're working on. Um, whether you're working alone or in a team, it's really crucial to sustaining a research project over time. So if you want to be able to revisit your project in a couple months or a year or two years, being having a consistent project management is really, really critical to be able to reorient yourself to what's going on in a project. But the question becomes, maybe we could adopt a project management organization that just worked for our research group. Maybe we could all make our own new file formats and our own new data standards and every group could be an island. Um, how do we worry about describing our organization to other research groups, right? Like how can we make it so we can actually share what we're doing and other people can understand it easily without joining the lab and reading a whole manual. So what we'd really like in, in the dream world is to be able to automatically aggregate information. We want to be able to pull information from different sources. Uh, and by different sources, I mean different labs. And we want to be able to understand how that information is all organized in a way that we can immediately push it all together and maybe do something cool like a meta-analysis, right? Um, and so there are a lot of ways to think about this, right? So I've said project management involves a lot of different components of your uh, research. So there's code, there's data, there's documentation. For the purposes of the rest of this introduction, I'll really be focusing on collaborating across data sets because I think it's actually a pretty common use case. All right, so we've talked about project management. Maybe you have a little bit of a better idea about why I think it's important and why I'd really encourage you to think carefully about how you design and manage your projects. 
But now that we want to share with other folks or just make it so that other people can understand what we're doing, let's think a little bit about standards. And to do that, I just want to zoom out for a second and think about what do we mean when we talk about reproducible science. So JB introduced this concept yesterday of reproducibility and how it's been a big problem in the field, in almost every field, uh, recently. And so what we could think about is there's different kinds of reproducibility, you could almost say, and those are, are really different things. So if we have the same data, we could do the same or a different analysis. If we have different data, we could also do the same analysis or a different analysis. And each of those mean different things. Um, a lot of times what we're focusing on is just doing the same analysis with the same data. And that really is hard enough a lot of times, especially if you don't understand exactly how the data was organized or as Pear talked about yesterday, if you can't access the same environment. Um, there's all sorts of things that can make that a complication. But when we want to share with other researchers, we're really kind of thinking in these two scenarios. So either we want to have the same data. So let's say we acquired a data set, we ran an analysis on it, and we'd like our collaborators to run a different complementary analysis that they specialize in, right? So we can say that we want it to be reproducible within our research group, but we also want it to be robust and show similar results with different kinds of analyses. Or we could think that you know, we have the uh, same analysis, but we have slightly different data. So let's say, you know, we and a collaborating group both collect resting state fMRI, and we want to see how the two different sites perform with a similar kind of analysis. In both of these cases, the critical factor is that we need to make sure that the data is understandable by other research groups. So we need to make sure that things like the timing information, if we're doing you know, resting state fMRI, or for example, the, um, the subject information is something that can be uh, learned consistently from the data itself. And it's not something that we need to explain each time we go and share. And I can already hear, um, if, not, if people are not saying it, they're definitely thinking it, then the question is, what if you can't share? Let's say I'm working with a data set and you know, I don't know if my PI will let me share it, or you know, that just hasn't been a topic yet, I don't think we will be able to share it, or maybe I know we won't be able to share it. In those situations, why should you care about any of this? And I just want to acknowledge that there are a lot of barriers that do prevent us from sharing, right? There are things like participant consent to share or lack thereof. So if you didn't ask participants before you collected the data, um, could you share the data? No, you'd need to go reconsent them. Um, code licensing, where maybe you've written some code, but you haven't licensed it, or your colleagues haven't licensed it in a way that allows for sharing. That would be something where you'd you uh, couldn't redistribute it, for example. Um, trademark stimuli. So this is something near and dear to my heart. Um, if you're doing something like showing participants movies in the scanner, right? Like movies are under copyright. You can't just give away movies for free. We learned that from LimeWire. Um, so that would prevent you from sharing those stimuli. And time. I think this is the biggest one for a lot of people is that if you uh, have, you know, if you all of a sudden are asked to share your data, you think about all the time that would need to go into making it something where people can understand what's going on. And I just want to acknowledge that all of these are real and all of these are important considerations to think about with sharing. So I want to convince you, though, that in these cases, you should still care about having um, your research conform to standards. You still want, even if you can't share your research today or maybe ever, to think about how you can standardize the way your data and really your whole project is organized. And what I'm going to call this is the open by design approach. Uh, so this is a logo from Mozilla, which as JB mentioned, I was lucky enough to participate in Mozilla Open Leaders, and I think they've been really great in this space. But there are a lot of folks who have been thinking really carefully 
about uh, what it means to make things open by design. And what I mean by that is that when you start your research project, or when you start the process of uh, designing your project management, you really think from the start, what would this project look like if I could share it tomorrow? And if you do this, if you keep this idea in mind, where you're thinking about sharing from the beginning rather than at the end, uh, a lot of these things fall into place in a way that is really, really powerful. Okay, so open by design, what does that really mean? Uh, there's a really lovely paper that I just want to plug by Yar Kalchenko and Michael Hanke, um, specifically talking about open by design in research. But the main takeaway is that if we design research to be shared openly, we make it easier to share later. And we can, in fact, specifically address a lot of those concerns that we had just previously. So if we're worried about, um, you know, maybe when I get asked to share, I won't have participant consent. When you start the project, you can specifically try and go for open consent forms. And what I mean by that is standardized consent forms that specifically request participant uh, approval to later share the data. So that if you use these kind of consent forms at the start of your project, then when it comes later and you realize you would like to share or you can share, the approval is already there. You don't need to worry about reconsenting. So open brain consent is a really great example of that. PEAR has been really involved in an extension of open brain consent specifically for GDPR, the general data protection regulations in Europe. Um, and I think these sorts of templates are really, really valuable there. Another thing is make sure you use standard licensing. So when you're collecting data or writing code, you can think about up front, what kind of license would you put this under? And I think one thing that really throws people off is licensing is not just for code, right? You can license data, you can license all kinds of things. Um, the key is to choose an appropriate license and I would argue an open license. Um, but you know, whatever you want to do, just making sure you're informed about the kind of license that you want to apply to your project and thinking about that again at the beginning is really key. So I would recommend here resources like chooseolicense.com, which will help you think about you know, what are the particular constraints that I have in my project and what kind of license would best fit those. Another thing is understand copyright laws when choosing your stimuli. Um, this is something that is just really important. It's really a shame if you use stimuli and you intend to share it and you get to the end of your project and realize you can't. Um, so that doesn't mean you can't use copyright stimuli in your studies, but you need to think about a slightly different way to share them, whether that's uh, you know something where you could just have a really strong description of what exactly you did to get that stimuli. You know, what, what DVD did you buy exactly? Um, and how exactly was it presented? Um, there are all kinds of ways to think about this, but if you do that work in the beginning of really carefully noting how you created your stimuli, that can go a really long way into making it later able that you could at least share those descriptions, if nothing else. And as for time, everything is easier if you start at the beginning. Um, if you start, if you plan uh, to be open at the start and you design your whole project that way, later on, if circumstances arise such that you could share, you're in a much better position to do so. And I'm gonna argue that the other incentive is even if you're never able to share, one, you've gotten the standard that as we talked about will help kind of maintain consistency for yourself and for your colleagues over time. And the other is this really powerful one that Chris is going to talk a lot more about in 45 minutes or so, uh, which is that you can take advantage of other people's open work throughout your project's life cycle. So if you adopt a standard and there's a standardized tool out there that is designed to work with data in this format, all of a sudden you can use that tool. Um, which can be really, really amazing. It means you can take advantage of people's really hard work to create really amazing tools, but they've just designed them around standards. And so once your data is in a standard, now you can think about that. So 
this is like a, a, a pretty powerful, I think, argument in terms of even if you can't yet share, you should still be thinking about standards throughout your project management process. Okay, we're almost at 45 and I see a couple questions. So I might want to take just, I just might want to take two questions and then like a two minute break and then we can finish up. Does that sound okay? Okay, cool. Um, first question, can you please explain robustness, which is doing different analyses on the same data? What would be the usefulness of that? Ah, yes, okay, let me go back. Cool, okay, so this is the, the box we're talking about. Um, and this, I, I have it on the slides, but I just want to say this is taken from the Turing Way, which is a really great resource put together by researchers in the UK. Um, to explain reproducible uh, data science. And so there are lots of definitions of all of these terms. I like this definition, um, but they do have a good description of, of many of the other definitions. So in their classification, robust means that you have the same data and you do different analyses. Um, the usefulness of something like this could be, for example, I'm gonna pull an example from fMRI because this is where I think. Uh, but for example, let's say that you're looking at uh, resting state connectomes and you find an effect, let's say, between two different groups, but you want to know is that effect dependent on the particular parcellation you chose. So you try and see if your effect is robust to parcellation by repeating the exact same analysis, but with just a slightly different parcellation as a start. That's a great question. Um, the other question is, any recommendations on how to deal with this? I'm going to assume sharing data based on where the question was. Um, on any deal with what we know, given the delays and complexity of the red process at McGill, it seems particularly constraining at the MNI. Yes, um, I would agree with that. I would say it is pretty constraining at the MNI at the moment. There are a lot of people who are really actively working on this problem um, and are really thinking about what do we need to do to make it so that our institution is a little bit easier to share data. Um, and the best I would say you could do at the moment is again just to be open by design because if you know it becomes easier for the red process to allow for openly sharing data. Your data is already organized in a way where it's easy to share or you've already done all the work of adopting in your own workflows this process of expecting stand data that's standardized in a certain way or expecting to write your code in a certain way. Um, and so when you've done that, it makes it much, much easier for then if institutional conditions change to be able to go and share your data. But it is, it is really hard. There's no good answer. There are a lot of things kind of impinging on one another in this uh, particular space. I've heard advice from some people in TOSI that one thing you can do is to try and make an argument for like the legal precedence of sharing data, but that's, that's a legal argument. That's not a standards argument. And so I, I'm not the best person to make it there. Um, but I, I do, I definitely am sympathetic to that concern. I think it's really important. Okay, cool. All right, we're at 47. Let's take a three minute break until 50 and then we'll wrap this up. Sounds good. Uh, while uh, we are taking a few minutes break, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to go and uh, ask questions and uh, uh, Yes, those uh, sharing data is uh, like a long and uh, difficult, like, uh, you know, it has implication in terms of like uh, ethics and legal aspects. Uh, there's, uh, you know, I know for instance, Pierre, you battled a bit with uh, even the uh, uh, the Quebec laws that are, you know, or the GDPR that are, you know, like protecting the uh, uh, people, uh, and like identity and, and, and information, and that's, uh, and that sometimes is a little bit of a you know a gray area. How it can conflict or not with uh, sharing data. In yeah. general, 
it's uh, it's not uh, usually a massive problem for uh, new imaging data and you know and you we, you see on the open euro for instance such a, a great number of repositories that are uh, uh, shared and uh, and and that's uh, you know like entirely legally and uh, ethically correctly and all those things uh, one of the things that is critical is that whenever there is a new uh, study the informed consent form has to be very uh, very well done such that uh, sharing is uh, is not um, uh, an ethical problem and you don't have to have like a re Recontact this, the participants to get their cons consent uh, is uh, is one of the bigger uh, hassle that uh, sometimes happens in some studies. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's 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 a complex thing, but I think a, a lot can be done uh, um, following uh, the uh, recommendation that you you're hearing uh, now. Pierre, you wanted to say something. Uh, no, just because you mentioned that I had a, a bit of issues with the Quebec law and. Uh, it had very different experience in McGill and at UDM. And at McGill, I was allowed to share uh, neuroimaging data openly. The data was hosted in the US. And because there was very little uh, phenotypic information, they considered that there was no problem with that. Mm. Uh, at UDM, uh, our uh, ethics committee is led by Joanne de Champlain, who's a lawyer and uh, very experienced. And according to her, this is illegal. Uh, you cannot share data unless there is a clear purpose that people have consented to. Mm. Uh, so you cannot do open-ended sharing through open neuro or other means, according to her. And she happens also to be at my institution. So <laughs> for a number of my initiatives, I, I have to go through that. And yeah. quite frankly, I, I don't know who's right after, you know, looking into that for years. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it really, uh, I mean, uh, I think it's a general uh, message that you're giving here that's it's very often depends on who is there and what, what, what who, who is that person that is taking what decision uh, and like a, it and it varies a lot of across institutions uh, mm -hmm. have a nice story about these sort of things uh, for like uh, the um, uh, material data transfer agreement with uh, UC Berkeley I'll tell you the story once <laughs> you know another time uh, because I think we need to uh, resume now but uh, this you know it, it depending on the, as you're absolutely right depending on your institution people have different interpretation of the same text uh, and uh, and that's uh, that's why it's uh, it's uh, looks often a little bit of a gray area and it's, it's hard to uh, uh, to clarify what's 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 right and what's not right yeah but I think that the key that I want to bring home is like, no matter what your institutional stance is, even if you're not going to share, if you design it such that it could be shared, there are a lot of benefits to that. Um, and, and one of the key, again, one of the key aspects is really the informed consent uh, in our area. All right. What we're talking about still is just this idea that even if you can't share, you should still really be thinking about these issues of project management and data standards and that they're still going to be useful to you in some way. So what do I mean when I say standards here? Um, <laughs> I love this XKCD comic. It gets to a very similar point as the Panda video um, that you'll have to watch later. But the XKCD comic says, I sent you the data. Thanks. This is a Word document containing an embedded photo you took of your screen with the spreadsheet open. Yeah, does your computer not support .norm files? Maybe you need to update. <laughs> Since everyone sends this stuff this way anyway, we should just formalize it as a standard, right? Like this could be a standard. I have had this happen once uh, where someone sent me a screenshot and they were like, this is what you need. And I was like, it's not, I just, I need the file. Um, but it happens enough that we're like, sure, this could be a standard, right? We could all do this. We could all just take pictures of our screen on our cell phones and send them to one another and call it a standard. But let's not. Um, and the reason is that we shouldn't is we should really think about what is a standard? What, what makes a good standard? What makes a bad standard? And I'm going to say that pictures from our phone of our computer screen is bad standard. Um, the reason is when you're thinking about what a standard is or should be, what we really want is to make it easier for colleagues to work with our data. And again, by colleagues, I mean both uh, your colleagues in the lab or also in uh, yourself in the future, right? You are, you are your own colleague. Um, 
And so if we want it to make it easier for colleagues to work with our data, we need to recognize that human readable is a low bar. So humans can read pictures that we take of our cell phone, of our screen and send it to one another, but it's, it's not the ideal way to get your data. What we really want is machine readable data. We really want data that you can just put in a script and it will automatically be able to parse it correctly. And my favorite example, uh, recent example, is actually the hyperlink on that XKCD comic I just showed you, is this example from the city of Detroit, where for their election data, they had a spreadsheet listing all the precincts and they included clip art numbers to mark the input data, such that what ended up happening is that if you tried to convert the data from this version of the spreadsheet into, for example, a TSV file that you could read in something like NumPy or Pandas, it came back totally empty. So it was human readable, but it was not machine readable, um, which means that it's really not a good standard because you can't actually work with this data in a systematic way. You can just look at it. And what we want is to be able to work with our data. So in particular, what we really want is we want to be fair. Um, so this is an acronym that's quite popular in uh, many domains of research data management. And I think it's a really lovely one in that we want data and other research objects like code, but again, I'm just gonna focus on data, to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I'm gonna go through what each of these things mean, but it really helps to be able to say, okay, I want fair data. I want it to have all of these attributes. So what is fair? Um, so findable is pretty vague. What we mean is that we need to be able to find the data in some way in order to be able to reuse them. Um, that means things like the data is named in a unique way. So it has a unique and persistent identifier. For example, you don't change your subject names from day to day, or you don't have your subject names conflict with one another. So you have two subjects with the same subject ID, right? Like that would be non-findable. You couldn't find the unique data record there. They have rich metadata associated with them, which means that you have uh, descriptions of the data available. So you know things, for example, in neuroimaging, you know things like uh, what were the scanning parameters that this particular file was associated with. And the metadata includes the identifier of the data they describe. So just as before where I said it needs to be unique and persistent, if you said things like some of this data has this scanning parameter and another portion has a different scanning parameter, but I can't tell you which, right? That wouldn't be very useful. Um, you want to have that direct mapping so we can find all the relevant pieces of the data. Um, and then they're indexed or registered in a searchable resource. So this could mean a lot of things, um, but what I'm gonna say is that it's something that you can easily access and search and maybe for the sake of this it's even just in your like lab server let's say we want them to be accessible right so in fair that means we can access the data either with authentication authentication and authorization so if you need a username and password because it's not public data that's available or if the data is openly available you can freely get it from, for example, the internet or from another data portal on the internet. Um, and then, yes, so then you also want to be able to retrieve the metadata in the same process. And critically, even if the data is no longer available, information about the data is still available. So if the data gets deleted in some way, you still have some record of what used to be there. FAIR means that it's interoperable. Um, so the data can be integrated with other, other data, applications or workflows. What does that mean? Uh, it means that the metadata used, there's a lot of terms here, and I'm gonna come back to why in a little bit. But the point is that the metadata that's available is in a way that's structured such that other people can interact with it. Other tools, other workflows. It's something that's recognized by the community in some way. 
and it uses the metadata itself uses fair principles. So I would be able to look at this and tell, you know, oh, I can learn about this term by going to this other resource. And of course, it links out to other data as necessary. So for example, if you use a particular um, analysis software, and you need to note in your metadata that you use that analysis software, you would link in some way to like maybe the paper of that analysis software or some other standardized representation of it. Okay, and finally, reusable. This is often the main one if we want to be able to uh, share our data with colleagues. This is the one we think about first. And what I mean is that they're, the data are well described so they can be used in different settings. So I can use them for my own analyses, your colleagues could use them for their analyses, I could use them for different analyses in a year. And the way we do that is making sure that the metadata are richly described. So we have all the information about the data that we need. For example, uh, if you do neuroimaging, I don't know if you've encountered this, I certainly have where you have the repetition time, but maybe you don't have the slice timing information available, right? Like that's not ideal. Um, if you're missing some key attribute about the data that you may need later. Okay, I just threw a lot of terms. I said the word metadata a lot. Um, and you may be thinking, this is great, but I have literally no idea what I'm supposed to do with this uh, based on all of the information I just learned. So, what I want to tell you is that FAIR is fuzzy, right? And that's intentional. That's, that's by design. FAIR is a general set of principles that should guide research across domains. It's not specific to neuroscience or any other domain. It's a very domain general thing. And so they speak in this very domain general language. Everything that they say is true and important, but if you want to conceptualize that right away into what can I do for my tools tomorrow, it's a little bit harder to think about. So for example, what does it mean to have rich metadata? You know, that means something completely different for neuroimaging and genomics research, and that's fine. That's just the way it's supposed to be uh, because we do different research. We have slightly different needs. So what that means realistically is that every discipline needs its own fair standards. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable standards need to be developed for everyone else. And I really like this example, um, which is that we need to reinvent the wheel. So being, uh, or we often get told that reinventing the wheel is a bad thing, right? We get told that you shouldn't reinvent the wheel, just use the wheel that's there. But we need to reinvent the wheel a lot in that, for example, you wouldn't put the same wheel on your car as on your bike. They're just different wheels. There's to some extent that does count as reinventing the wheel because we have different wheels that we're using. And so what we're, we want is we want a wheel, we want fair standards for each discipline. Um, luckily, we're not the first people to think about this. This is a really common issue. And this is where community-based standards can come in. Because a lot of people have had this thought before about what would it look like to have something that's fair for my discipline by pooling with other people's thoughts and, and using something that's community-based, we can get a lot further. Okay, so maybe you're not yet on board with FAIR, maybe it's just too long of an acronym or there are too many times I said metadata and you're like, why, why am I using community-based standards? XKCD, again, has a perfect comic here, um, which is how standards proliferate. So, for example, if you say, I'm going to make my own new standard for neuroscience because there are currently 14 competing standards, and that's ridiculous. You know, I'm going to make one standard, it's going to cover every use case, it's going to be fair. Now there are 15 competing standards. So, what ends up happening is that every time someone or some group of people try and make a brand new standard, it usually adds to the number of standards available rather than synthesizing all of the existing standards. Um, so how can community-based help? One thing is if you just pool with other groups and really think about you know, what attributes of these standards can we learn and gain from everyone else, it can make a really big difference to help with the synthesis, synthesis um, of all of these. And 
what do I mean when I say community-based standards? Because pooling with other groups is more than a bit unclear. Um, in particular, I want to argue that community-based standards are developed openly. That means that anyone could log on and see the development process for themselves and get involved there. They strive for consensus in decision making, um, which means that they really don't favor a minority position. So there aren't one or two people who really hold the power in deciding a standard, what it should look like or what it shouldn't look like. They really try for the most part to get consensus from all community members. Obviously that's not possible all the time and there are some accommodations for that, but the goal is always to, to have everyone on board. And also they're designed to empower and equip community members. So it's very different to be in a room and to just be there and have people having a conversation around you than to be brought into the conversation. Standards that are community developed recognize that everyone has their own unique experience and their own challenges that they faced and overcome that they can bring towards having this conversation about how do we develop a, a new fair standard or how do we improve an existing standard to be more fair. And so by doing this, more people are brought on and the standard ends up being more comprehensive. Okay, we're really lucky in neuroscience in that a lot of people, as I said before, have been thinking about this for a while. And we actually have several really good community-based standards for neuroscience data. Um, two that I really wanna highlight are the brain imaging data structure and neurodata without borders. And I wanna say that both of these uh, are really cool in that they've been endorsed, which is this new thing that's being done by INCF, which is a major uh, organization within neuroscience specifically designed to help set standards for the field and improve um, how information or neuroscience information is conveyed and managed and uh, supported. So as I said, I'm a neuroimager, so I'm going to personally focus on BIDS, which is the brain imaging data structure. But if you work with uh, systems neuroscience, I really do want to point you to Neurodata Without Borders because I think it's an amazing resource and it's only growing in the community base that's using it and supporting it. Okay, so what is BIDS? I told you it's the brain imaging data structure, um, and you'll hear a lot more from Chris M uh, about exactly how we can use it and what it can do for us. But what it really is, is it's a, a specification, a standard that was developed out of many people's efforts, but um, for several years led by Chris Gorgolewski in the lower right here, and it's design to include many different aspects in neuroimaging data. Um, so it's not only designed to include MRI data, but MEG, EEG, um, it's working on including PET and quantitative MRI. There's all sorts of work that's gone into this to try and develop a representation for neuroimaging data as a whole that we can use to more easily facilitate communication across labs. Um, and okay, this sounds great, but what does it really mean? What does it look like? Um, so I just want to show you just a really, really small example. So this is a data set that I grabbed um, a little bit ago, and you can see I have subjects. So I have this sub-01, that's just the identifier for them. They have a session. In this case, they had 25 sessions. Um, that's a lot of sessions. So in this session, they had a diffusion weighted imaging, a field map and functional data acquired. And I can see that all of those are really seamlessly represented. And they have these .json files, which are the metadata that I kept telling you about. Um, it's already right there integrated with the data, which is really, really nice because now not only do I know what to expect when I look at this data, even though I've never worked with this particular data set before I downloaded it, I knew right away where things were and I knew where I could look if I needed to find more information about a particular file. Okay, so this sounds amazing. Um, it sounds like we could rule the world this way, right? And I just want to emphasize briefly that one thing about standards, particularly community developed standards, is 
we do have to think about the fact that we can't cover all possible use cases. So I really like this idea of the 80-20 rule, which is focus on the 80% use case to enhance clarity and collaboration. So if you start working with something with bids, you may find that there's some you know, unusual sequences you acquire or something similar that aren't quite covered in the standard, and that's very normal. Um, what's happening with community developed standards is it's really focusing on what will serve 80% of the use cases so that the standard is as clear and as consistent as possible. And as people use things more and more, they'll move, oops, there we go, they'll move into the 80% use case and then over time they'll become incorporated in the standard. But it's just very normal that you could start and you could see that one, you know, maybe one uh, sequence you're piloting isn't yet covered in the standard, that's fine. It should cover most everything that you work with. I, for example, know that uh, like data that I acquired during my master's was totally covered during the standard, which is really great because it was a sort of an unusual multi-echo sequence, but it's in there. So it's really, really nice to have. The other thing about community developed standards is I told you they're developed openly. So I just want to ping that as a community developed standard, BIDS and NWB and, and many uh, similar standards are all being developed on open platforms. So BIDS, for example, is being developed on GitHub. So you can go to GitHub and you can see issues that people are currently working on. There's currently a maintainer, uh, Stefan Apeloff, who will help guide you through either opening a new issue or contributing to issues um, and really kind of getting a better sense for how you can bring your data into the community. And that's a really important thing. That's the other thing I really want you to leave with is that you can contribute to these things and it's really important that you do um, because you have your own expertise with your kind of data and with your particular kind of analysis and a community standard needs that expertise to see where the standard is lacking and what it needs to add. Um, so definitely join the community. It's really, really important. And if you don't know where to start, um, you don't know how to get your data into bids or you just want to learn a little bit more about all of this, there's the bid starter kit, um, which is a resource designed uh, with so many people, but originally myself, uh, Kirsty Whitaker and uh, Dora Hermes, who went through, it's, it's designed to really make it easy for you to kind of get an overview of what do I need to get started with bids. What are things that I could use to get my data into bids? Where should I go if I have common questions? Um, you know, all of these sorts of things that everyone goes through. It's a really, really good place to get oriented um, to the standard and how you can get involved in it. Okay, so this sounds great. We've got this new community-based project management standard. Uh, and if you'll remember poor Professor Smith from the beginning with her grad student, Ellen, former grad student, Mike, um, let's say that she is now on this train. She's going to think about how to use bids for her own data, make sure her data is organized in bids. Well, now not only can students like Mike and Ellen benefit, they can also uh, have not only their data in bids, but they can also go and access other resources and know right away what that data looks like. For ex so for example, there's this repository called Open Neuro, um, which came up a little bit earlier when uh, we were discussing data sharing and whether or not you could post data there. But if you can post data there, or if you know how to work with bids and you want to get some bids data, Open Neuro is a really great place because what it has is a huge collection of openly available bids formatted data sets. And that makes it such that you can actually go in, grab the data and know right away what kind of data you're working with once you're familiar with the bid standard. And you can also learn more about that data because again, it has all of that metadata right there and easy to work with. Okay. And the other thing is, maybe you're like, this sounds great, but it kind of sounds like an edge case. Like, I don't know who would post data there. A lot of people would post data there. Um, and a lot of people use this data. There are lots of really cool data sets that have been uploaded to Open Neuro. So this screenshot is now very, very old. I apologize. Um, 
but there was the Midnight Scan Club data set uh, at the time was very new. And it had a bunch of views and it's an amazing data set. I'm not sure if anyone's seen this paper, but basically they have a small collection of people uh, that they scanned around midnight because the scanner was free then. And they did it consistently over a long period of time. So they have just a few people, but a lot of really in-depth data on them, which is a really cool data set. Um, and there are all kinds of other really amazing data sets that again, once you know bids or once you know um, at least that bids exists and that you can go and learn about these kinds of data, make all of this data super, super easy to work with. And then for things in Montreal, the other thing is um, tools will start supporting bids or have started supporting bids rather. So here, for example, is Brainstorm, which is developed by Sylvain Baez lab at the MNI. And they already have updated Brainstorm such that you can just import a bids data set right away and it will understand the structure because again, bids is a community developed standard. They have access to all the information they need to learn what the structure is just from the way the files are organized. And I'm not gonna talk about this. Chris, who I see has joined the chat, um, is going to talk about in much more detail bids apps. I just wanna kind of give you a teaser that they're amazing and wonderful and really, really exciting and something that you can do if you understand bits formatted data and you format your own data in bits. All right, so I just want to check in again on Professor Smith in 2030. Let's say she's fully adapted all of these practices. She's in the Jetsons future, right? Now she can grab data off open neuro. She can run bids apps both on openly available data and on her own data, which she has all organized in uh, community-based project management standards like bids. And it makes it much, much easier for her to work. Um, and, and she doesn't have to spend as much time doing things like sorting through Mike's project folders where everything was a bit uh, overwhelming to say the least. So she's, she's slimmed uh, all that excess work away and she's now got a crazy hairstyle. It's great. Um, okay. But again, today I really focus just on data. And I want to remind you that in project management, there's all kinds of different pieces to this involved. So again, in tier, we have the original data, the analysis data, the documents, and the command files. We really just talked about the analysis data. But if you look at all these other pieces, there are other tools out there that are rapidly becoming project management standards that could make it even easier to organize these pieces of your data in a systematic way. I'm not going to talk about these because they're not quite as uh, formalized, but I do want to point to them as really exciting developments that could uh, be something to watch out for in the future. All right, so hopefully today I've convinced you that community-based project management standards are something important, and now we have a better grounding in what is project management and why should I care? Why should I use standards for my project management? And why should I make sure those are community-based standards? And hopefully you'll leave knowing that project management is for everyone. So it's not just um, something that you need if you're working with a big team. It's, it's something you could use every step of the way. And if you think about community-driven standards, so things like BIDS or NWB, these are what really enable new kinds of science. Um, because now you can have access to a much larger data pool, you can understand it a little bit better, and you can get access not only to data, but also to tools that other folks have written um, that make it really easy to port those to your data because it expects this standardized structure. Okay, so that's it for me in terms of the presentation. But there are a lot of questions, and I'd love to talk about some of them. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, uh, let's uh, take some questions now. Yes. Oh, and this is something I don't know if people looked in the chat, but I do just want to say, uh, is there a similar standard to bids for behavioral data, psychophysics, social sciences, etc.? This is a great question. Um, and again, this is something where, remember, with FAIR and reinventing the wheel, we do need to reinvent the wheel a little bit for every domain. Um, so bids can handle behavioral only data, but it isn't particularly rich in its representation of behavioral only data. 
So there have been folks who are working really hard um, to, to make it so that this kind of data can be better represented. Either there are some folks who are working directly in bids. So I know there's a new extension proposal in bids to add motion capture data. Um, for example, if you have participants moving about and you want to have that information. But separately, there's another standard, which I think is really exciting, um, called PsychDS, or the Psychology Data Structure. And that's really designed to have a rich representation of uh, data that's common in psychological sciences, like reaction time, or uh, different task-based data, or questionnaire-based data. And so that's ongoing. I would encourage you, if you're interested, to check out PsychDS, and they're definitely looking for contributors. Um, so if you have data you want to share, or if you want to just kind of get a better sense of what's going on there, we can definitely share the, uh, yep, Chris shared the PsychDS link. So uh, just to add on what uh, you're saying, uh, uh, Elizabeth, is, uh, the, the difficulty is that, for instance, uh, you look at the bits that are set, and you look at the uh, TSV uh, uh, participant that are set, and you see something or, or some of the uh, sidecar files and you know, like uh, you see TR for instance and you and the TR is uh, like uh, the bits that set doesn't tell you whether you have uh, you, I mean tells you that you have to have the TR in seconds and not in milliseconds for instance this is like a, a small little things but uh, you know when you're going to try to work with uh, you know some other data sets uh, or the DACOM that's where the TR will be in milliseconds then you know like you have like a problem of, uh, of uh, finding out exactly what's, uh, what was that uh, number. For instance, in age, for instance, the, 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 just the age, if you look at what, how you define age uh, in a data set, uh, I mean, if it's uh, adult, uh, you know, uh, uh, cohort, uh, usually age will be age at scan uh, of, of in years, and that will be like, so you have a unit that years, you have like, you know, when, when is age and what's, what's the definition of age uh, that is taken. But if you, if you don't have that uh, definition, if you don't know what age is, it could be very well anything else. Uh, it could be age uh, you know, when, uh, uh, at a different moment. It could be age uh, in month if it's uh, you know, like an infant or, uh, or weeks. Uh, it could be and so on. So it's uh, you know, all the characterization and the, the, the right documentation and the documentation that uh, has to be done in a standard way uh, is is really tough, and you know, and you you could go very very long down that road, and it's a bit of a sometimes a rabbit hole because it's uh, you know if you really want to make that uh, very clear and uh, and machine readable and machine uh, actionable, it's it's uh, it's a difficult, very difficult task. So you just have to learn and uh, see what's the most practical and uh, uh, getting to the eighty twenty that uh, Elizabeth was describing, and you know, and and some do something practical and uh, and real. Uh, and that is as much as possible based on the standard and communication standard. And when we have different ways of standardization in different subfields, then we have a problem of integration. You know, you have like a, Elizabeth was saying, okay, genetic data and then neuroimaging data. And then you have all those you know, data sets that have, have both uh, genetic and neuroimaging. And, and you have to like uh, see, you know, uh, and psychological or, uh, and uh, behavioral data. And then you have to see what kind of, um, documentation we can put, which is, uh, you know, that can go across all those things. So for instance, for BIDS, there is a project uh, that is trying to uh, have a, a good description of uh, exactly what are the names and the terms that are defined and have a proper definition of those terms and that link to page where those terms are defined and that can link to like uh, the, uh, the data and all those things. And that's, uh, you know, you probably see that in the BIDS uh, data sets uh, in a year or two. Uh, hopefully before a year or two, but, <laughs> but that's, uh, and that's called the, that's the NIDM, uh, that's the term, uh, NIDM terms, which is neural imaging uh, uh, data model uh, term uh, project. So all those things are evolving. Uh, you just have to watch for those projects and, uh, and you know, learn the basic technologies there uh, and hopefully uh, uh, be aware of those things. And uh, that course uh, will help you with that, uh, we hope. Thank you again, Elizabeth, for this wonderful talk. Uh, that was that was absolutely wonderful.